Hey guys, today we're going to be doing the August cook-off for 2020 on Coach Up. And I think the plan for today is to lose 7 star because that's always the plan. So we're going to see how long it takes us to do that. Could be this contest. Could very well be the next one. But I assume it'll happen eventually. So uh, that's exciting. And then, as always, we're going to add in the new subs. So let's change my template for that. And we'll get started. Generally, the problems are going to take some time to look. Wait. They have a clarification already. Before the contest started. What? Okay, I guess we should be wary of that problem. So we will wait for the contest to load. As always, Let's see if it actually crashes this time. <laughs> Great. All right, what's what's going on here? Um, good start. Very good start. Come on, Coach Chef, I believe in you. Okay. Hopefully this doesn't last more than a few minutes so we can get started on this. Oh, I love Coach Chef. All right, so let's see, we're gonna read in the input and that part is done. So let's print the output and that part is done. Cool, we solved the problem. Now what? I guess we move on to the next one. Now right, let's go on CoForces and see who else is complaining about this. Um, where is this? Coach Chef August cook-off. So there's a reminder, the site's already crashed. Okay, so it's happening for other people. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Come on, they can't unbraid it already. The round hasn't even started yet. Coforce is loading. Okay, got a new page. Nginx. Now what? Now we're getting farther. Let's open a new tab, see if we can get anywhere here. Okay. <laughs> this is an easy way to get upvotes, just post about Coach F having errors and everyone will love it. So we got the Nginx, we got the 500, and now we're loading part of the page, but not the problems themselves. Oh wait, is this going to work? No. So the servers need to be scaled up. And hopefully the judging systems will be fine. Um, I don't know why when this will get better. Maybe people will give up on the contest and then, um... That would be good. That would be good indeed. We'd have fewer people to beat us. 
Okay. Code Chef is stubbornly crashing. Yeah, same to be honest. The last contest I did was like, I don't know, a couple months ago. And now that we're back, it immediately crashes. Let's um, go to discuss, I guess, and see, because there should be many more posts on here where everything is dying. Wait, it's working fine for some people? Why would it work fine for some people and not others? Now the site itself is down, instead of just everything. Alright, alright, we get it, it's not working. This is kind of concerning, we have Okay, this is a different blog. We have four different blogs that have um, this kind of thing. And also, just right now, you can hand out an F for Code Chef. That's terrible, but you know what I mean. Let's give an F for the servers, everyone. Okay. Anyway, enough messing around. Let's see if anything's happened. Um, <clears throat> okay, so first I wasn't responding to requests well, and then now the whole thing just dies. Oh, interesting. Oh, there we go. Now let's see if the problems will load. Um, maybe they will, maybe they won't. Oh, they fixed that. Okay. Good. What's the clarification? Chef party. Okay. Um, strictly convex polygon. According to the ith vertex, you're going to make them. Perform the following operations. So our parent polygon, draw one of its child polygons. Child polygon which you grew. Drew becomes a new parent polygon. Do the points matter? Why do they not give images? That's annoying. Um. So what's going on here? Negative 101, 101. Oh, but it has to be integer points. Wait. What exactly is this? Oh. 
Uh, let's see. So we start off with, um, okay, so I think the points themselves don't matter. All right, by the way, I'm not going to be doing perfect commentary because um, it is rated for me. So I will um, So we don't actually care about this. We're just going to we're just going to read it in for the input. I think then Each time you want to draw another polygon with the maximum number of vertices, and um, L and C equals N, cur equals N. So while cur is greater than four, because once we have four, we can't draw any more chords. And actually, Once we have five, we can't draw any more chords because you can just think of that. Then once we do, um, it would be we can draw another polygon with like the number of vertices we have divided by two. For example, if we had a hexagon, we could draw a triangle. If we had seven vertices, we could also draw another triangle. If we had eight, then we could draw like a, a quadrilateral and so on. So these are all long longs. Um, Yeah, I'm pretty sure that works. If it's six, yeah, so it's n over two. Oh no, come on, submit page, you can do it. Oh no, we solved the problem, but we can't submit it. Man. What is with that? Does the problem not load anymore? Oh, come on. All right, I guess I'll read the next one. Um, so this is one. It is not necessarily a red-blue tree. Wait. Um, each vertex is either red or blue, and adjacent vertices always have different colors. So it's bipartite. Um, it's not necessarily a red-blue tree, but its vertices are still colored red and blue. Choose two adjacent vertices and swap their colors. Okay, so there are only two possible final trees. Both of them are like the bipartite colorings. So, um, I don't know. What do we do? How do we, how do we, how do we do this? Um, well, let's see if this loads again. I can see this being very unfair to everyone, basically. Is admin here? No. Alright. So, I guess we can solve this one. Um, so then we're all test cases then like see 10 to the 6th. I just want to see the constraints so I can make sure that this is enough. Actually wait, we don't even need that. Just test on the sample one more time once the freaking page loads. Thank you. And yeah, okay, so oh wait. It does work. Okay, now what? Four ten. Okay, so we need fast IO, which we have. Send help. Yeah, 
because I have very big constraints for some reason, and 1.5 seconds. Okay, let's see if we can submit if it crashes. Okay. I assume the queue is going to take a long time too, because why not? And we pass. All right. Um, let's see what's going on now. Okay, so some people have solved this. All right, now we do this one. So first, first we check um, C into N um, vector L L edges and is at most ten to the fifth. So clear the edges. Um, edges x dot push back y. We're just reading in the tree. All right, all right, come on. This typing is getting me down. So now. So how do we verify this? Um. There are only two possible trees, and if something's wrong, then we'll paint it in a zero if it should be a zero, or we'll paint it in a one if it should be a one. Then we want to we want to pair up the zeros and ones in a minimal way possible, and. Um, the way we do that is if you've ever seen um, second threads the Lorax problem, then it's kind of the same idea. Where basically the number of swaps that have to cross a specific edge is either is um, is the minimum number of zeros or ones that have to cross that edge. So uh, I'm not gonna um. I'm just going to um, solve this, and then I'll explain it later. So first of all, void um, go okay. Um, so we're gonna make this here. Oh shoot. It's not what I meant to do. I'm gonna make infinity to be some large number. 1 e 15. Then Trying these samples. Oh, these samples suck. Okay.
All right, so um, okay, point DFS.
what is happening? Why is it printing? Okay. What? Oh, I didn't even read the string. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, okay, okay. Still zero. Why? Um, what? Oh yeah, that's important. Still. Um, what? What? Okay. Now that's wrong, but that's better. Um, so yeah. Two one two 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 oh two. How are there five? Oh, it's wreck, not tard. Okay, so Let's make a few stronger cases because I'm pretty sure Code Chef it's like obligatory to have terrible samples. So um, let's just add the sample into the sample. Try that. And that's a problem. Um, because yep, yeah, makes sense. This is why you test with multitest for stupid things like that. Okay, now let's check one where it's impossible. Five. Um, one, two, one, three, three, four, three, five. And we're going to say... No, oh, one, 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 oh. We're going to add that in. Okay, now let's check. Read in n. Clear all the edges. Um, read the edges. Read in the string. Set the colors. Invert the colors. Try both of them. Um, set the answer to infinity. Now check that. And, okay. Now set everything to zero. Everything is reset. So set the counts. Count if the count doesn't work. Doesn't work. Then... If the target is equal to the colors, then we don't need it, otherwise we do. Now we set this, and that plus equals z dot s, f, x dot s plus equals z dot f, s. Okay. Uh, ah, yeah, I think it works. Let's 
continue. String problem. Or not a string problem, a sequence. A pass, okay, good. Not many people have solved that. That's good. Oh, they extended it, so that's nice at least. So consider a sequence of even length. A left rotation consists of moving the first element of the sequence to the end. Sequence is good if it's okay. The sequence is good if yeah, some number of left rotations. Okay. Um, what if it was harder? Why are people solving the Div two problems? What? Okay, let's say it was a bit easier and there were no rotations. Then what would we do? We would, um, we would be able to do something. Contiguous subsequences. That's such an annoying term because, okay. Is it strictly greater or, yeah, greater, okay. In this case, what will we do? Check our rank first. Still hasn't updated, somehow. Okay, anyway, um, seems as good if it is possible to Perform some number of left rotations and divide the resulting sequence into two halves. Smallest value is greater than the largest value in the second half. So let's see, if everything's the same, then it's impossible. Um, there are many ways in which it's impossible, I think. Like, it also has to be true that everything in the first half has to be greater than everything in the second half, which, I mean, is kind of obvious. Then, then what? So how do we even count this for a single sentence? Well... I wonder what would, so would it have to be sorted? Is that what we're counting? Because if it wasn't sorted, then, so if there are no rotations, then first of all, the subsequence would have to be sorted. No, no, it's not true. It would just be that the, yeah, it's not true at all. Never mind. <laughs> okay, there's some smooth way to count this. I mean, I assume there has to be. Okay, I'm not doing terribly, I guess. Um, yeah, we have a pretty good time on the first two problems, but now we have to continue. Okay, let's still look at this one first. So n 10 to the 6th, 2.5 seconds, which means it could be some ugly time limits. Great. Oh, they're distinct. Okay, that's good to know. I did not read that. You know what, let's just scan through the rest of the problem and see if we miss anything else. Left rotation sequence is good. Left rotations divide the resulting sequence. So it does, yeah, 
Okay, okay. That that makes it much makes it considerably nicer actually. So first we can do coordinate compression and then all the numbers will be within the range of zero to n minus one. Then let's say we looked at all subsequences of length two. Then what we have to do is we have to count how many of those are good. As it turns out, all sequences of length two are all subsequences of length two are good because we just put the bigger element in front of the smaller one, and that would be good. So what about length four? Length four is harder. Um, Yeah, actually, let's not fixate on lengths. Let's say what if we do want to fixate on lengths? I'm not sure. Let's say we fix the element that's the um, the median. Then everything less than or equal to that medium will be zero. Everything greater than or equal to that medium will be one. And then we want to count the number of sequences that have that as the median with that are that are good. Let's say. So is that easy? Let's see, indeed, is that easier? And if so, what will be easier about it? So all of the ones have to be like together. Um, Oh, wait. Is there something cool here? Like, so all of the zeros and all of the ones have to be contiguous. That is, the zeros have to be together or the ones have to be together. So, What does that do for us? Does it do anything? That is a question. What do we have to do to efficiently count the things of length? Something. If we fix the length, does it help? Let's read this one too. There are n chefs and m dishes. Each child I, the I chef, cook dishes of exactly one type.
All the chefs are ranked in a row from Chef 1 to Chef N. Okay. So I guess we create a graph with two types of edges and then How that work? Keep refreshing this to just try and see which one's not as hard. Um, I think this one's more approachable. So let's keep trying this one and we'll see what happens. So one thing that's interesting is that if if some subsequences for some or if some subarray is for some reason not good, and that means okay, what if we count the number of subarrays that aren't good? Let's say that maybe that's easier. So a subarray is not good if. I don't know what makes it not good. So we do fix the median, then a subray is not good if it has some instance of like. Hmm. No, it's not necessarily true because there's some wraparound, wraparound stuff going on here, which is annoying. But if a subarray is not good, then it means everything that contains it also can't be good, I think. Can anyone solve these? Still no. Okay. So we'll continue thinking. Which one is the one in div 2? Um, beautiful subsequence, okay.
don't know why they call it a subsequence. Like, the proper term is, oh, whatever, I don't care. Sorry, I'm not scrolling on the bars. I guess we'll fix the starting point. Let's try that one. So we say So we count the number of beautiful ones that start here and and then what? There are a lot of things to fix, and none of them seem to be working out. Oh wait, wait, we have that property. If something's not good, then any subsequent- wait, is that true? I don't even know if that's true. If something's not good, is it also true that the subsequence that contains it isn't good? I don't know. I, that may not be true, necessarily. If it was some ugly n log squared n, they would have to be nicer with what they have. We have two, seven, three, five, like seven. I don't even know what I'm thinking. Um, how do we do this? I don't think what I'm thinking actually works. Because the case I have in mind, I guess, would be 
um, like two, five, three, seven, eight, nine. Now this subsequence is good because it's like two. This one is not good because these are the two biggest elements and you can't ever bring them together. However, this one is good because you can rearrange it to be like seven, eight, nine, two, five, three. And the two halves, seven's bigger than five, so it works. So that doesn't work. Um, but maybe fixing the starting point is still a good thing to go for. Why would that be a good thing to go for? Does that help? Um, we... What can we do? So it's definitely also not true that once the sequence is good, all of the bigger ones automatically become good. That we can't say. And we also can't say that once the sequence stops being good, everything bigger than it also stops being good. So indeed, that does not work. What else can we do then? My ideas have not worked out, so let's um, have some submissions for this. Wait, what? It's been judging for 24 minutes? That is weird. Okay, let's try, um, I don't know, let's try this one. Oh, no, and we'll destroy each of the end chefs if I eat at least one dish. So, first of all, you have to have at least two because, um, okay, this one we can do two pointers on. Because adding more chefs in only makes it easier, and removing chefs makes it harder. However, the issue is that two point is going to be n squared because one thing affects a lot of things.
So we'll add and remove each chef exactly once. Now we have a solve on this. And it was someone above me, that's fine. Someone who also probably should be red. <sighs> okay. Chess evaluates at least one dish. Alright, so I'm assuming it would be some sort of two pointers, but we have to do it efficiently. Um, how do we do it efficiently? Because the issue is that when we turn on, when we toggle a chef, it'll it'll like it'll toggle everything with the same F value. Which is a problem because the hell is the sum of n times k plus 1? That's such a weird constraint. d1, d2, dk are pairwise distinct. Is that a typo they've corrected or are they just gonna, they're just going to leave it there? Nice. Okay, so 3 seconds, big constraints, whoop de doo that guy's in first now. Nice. Okay. I don't know why these constraints just have to be so tight. Let's consider the components formed by the, the the things the chef can make, ignoring the friends. Or the things that chefs can make, ignoring the friends. Um, well, what do we do? We will. If we have two things in the same, if we have two chefs in the same component, then the entire component is satisfied. Otherwise, hmm, that's hard to measure. So let's first consider just the friends and ignore the things that components do. Now either we don't have a chef in some component, we have one or we have two, or we have we have one or we have greater than one. If we have greater than one, then the entire component will be happy. If we have one, then the entire component except for that chef will be happy. And otherwise we have none. Um, okay, so I, I have a general idea, I guess. C into N. Alright, how much typing speed are you going to screw me over now? Okay, so we have a solve on this too, which is fine. Wait. This guy real purple is he one of those smurfs? Huh, oh, okay. Um C C to represent the component. And we'll zero next it. Because why not? Um, and 
lines follow. For each I, the i of the lines contains k separate. Oh, wait, each, okay. For um, BL edges, what is it? 3005. I dot push back X, okay. CTI equals zero. Now what we do is we're going to do two pointers. So So point is exclusive, the end of the interval we have. So if it's equal to n and it's not possible, then we're done. There's nothing we can do. Otherwise, um, if it's equal to n, it is possible, and there's one subarray. Otherwise, let's say it's at n minus 1, then we have both the subarray and the subarray that includes n minus 1, and so on. So it's n minus 1 plus 1. Okay. Then del i. Okay, now we just need to do this. Um, how? First, update the friends. So if friend x equals zero, then it gets a new friend. So Right. 
targ. This is something we have to do. So if there are no friends, then else plus plus friend x. So if there are no friends, then that's the only time it's going to be affected. So let's see. Now we have to check if its component is already set. So if ctcx is equal to zero plus plus total plus plus um, wait, hang on, this is different. Um, hello, this is count. So this is plus plus count x. Plus plus total then. Okay, what do we have to do? So if there, if there's nothing in the component, let me add the total, and that should be it, because it becomes part of the total now. Else, if ctc cx equals one, then um, llv equals targ cx dot begin. If v is equal to um, what is it? ct if v is equal to x then friend x is 0 so plus plus total Because that's the only time where it wouldn't be set with friend x is zero, and either its component is empty or it's not, it's the only one not set within its component. Okay. Perfect. So now we add to the count, because now this one's within the interval. And we insert it to the target. Let's see. We don't affect the friend of this one. Edges don't change. OK. Now we do delete. Wait, first, let's, let's actually do the component stuff. Does it matter which order we do in it? I don't think it does. So now, um, if, let's see, ct, ci, it's equal to 1, then If friend x equals zero, plus plus total. 
if friend v equals 0 plus plus total. Because that means if it's not set, then we'll make it set. That works, I hope. dci equals 1. Else, if ctci equals 0. Otherwise, nothing else would change. So, cur equals. What would it be? So, it would be count ci. Then, lo new equals. Um, what is it? Then um, if friend wait so the current is the ones that are currently set, which may or may not include this one. Then the new vowels, the ones that are going to be set. And if this one is included, then we include it. Then total plus equals cur minus nval. And if this is 2, it doesn't matter. So now um, we'll do the same thing. So if total equals n, pause equals 1. I would say pause equals total equals n. Now I'll do the same thing. So if it's 1, then there's something that we have to be concerned about. Otherwise, um, it's not. So first we do minus minus count x. So then if count cx is equal to 0, we subtract it. That should be the same thing, actually. It should be the same thing, except we just undo exactly what we just did. Now we do the component stuff. Minus minus erase. So now we check this. So TCI is equal to one, then new val equals count ci cur equals size ci minus 1. Then if the one we're deleting is still set for something else, then we'll keep it. Then we'll subtract. Otherwise, if this is 2, so then v equals targ cx dot begin. If the number of friends is 0, then we Subtract from the total, otherwise we increase it. And otherwise it doesn't make a difference. Nice. Uh, right. I forgot I gave up on templates. Okay, so yeah, should work. Maybe it'll crash. I suspect it might. I can even copy this sample. Nice, what happens there? What's it doing?
jokes concerning me is that I can't even do them both at the same time. Um, okay, let's just focus on the second one, actually. So this is good. What is happening? How does it decrease? <laughs> does it even get close to end? Epic. Why? Why would it decrease? So first of all, that's fine. Now this is that. Oh wait, this should be new val minus cur. Whoops. So new val is smaller, so therefore this will decrease. Okay, let's try that. <laughs> Why is it seven? Come on. Makes sense. Got total O one. So now we're inserting zero, insert two, insert three, insert four, insert five. Why why does this happen? Come on. So we're inserting this here. So that's, wait, this is wrong. When we insert 0, we should have 3. When we insert that, we should have, why would it be 4? Wait, when we insert 1, we should have 2. First, we add 2 as a friend. Else if count c i is equal to zero, c t. Then cur equals count, and val equals size. What's this? If 
difference here is zero. So two zero. Wait, why is cur ah? Aha. That's fun. So we actually get nine. Then what happens if we do both of these? die for some reason? No, it actually works. Okay. Um, this is very sketchy though. I'm scared of running this. So, first of all, let's just do a few sanity checks. So four, we're going to paste both samples on top of each other. And we should get 0909. Okay, but just to make sure, let's reset everything. So, Edges, we clear at each point. Then count, or CT, we reset. FR, we reset. Count, we reset. All of these before they're relevant. Um, targ, we should reset too. Now all of these should be naturally reset on their own. Like target, for example, shouldn't have any elements by the end of it, but we're just going to be safe in case I make some calculation error. Size, we reset. Oh, we already reset total. Okay. So total equals possible equals zero. Now, this complexity is just n log n. Totally fine, hopefully. Um, Okay, let's make a stronger case. Let's say like eight, I don't know, three, two, where each guy is two friends, then we have one, 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 two, 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 three, three. I don't know, just be nice to myself. Okay, so two, three, three, four, four, five, five, six, six, seven, seven, eight, eight, one. Um, one, two. I don't actually know what this should be. Okay, let's see. So you insert, so you put, so you take one, and then you'll do all of this. You'll have two and three. Then you take two, then you'll have three and four, so you'll have these. You take three, you take four, you take 5, and you take 6. So now we've taken 6, which means 3 of these subintervals are fine. So now we have this, and we still have this, so 3 of these subintervals are fine. Then we have 9 here. Then once we go here, we have to include the last one so we can get both of these. Right? Yes. Wait, let's just, um, let's make it easier on myself. So we're here. Point is five at this point. Wait, is that right? Because when we're forced to take this one, we can have this. Can we have this? Does this work? Right, um. So the points are five, which is here. 
which means we claim this subinterval works. Does it work? So we have 2, 3. This has 3, 4. This has 4, 5. This has 5, 6. This has 6, 7. But how do we... How do we get 8? Um, okay, that's a bit scary. So once we insert this, we get 2. Once we insert the next one, we get 4. Once we insert the next one, we get 5, 6, and... We were counting components wrong? Okay, that's good to know. So, so let's count CX. So it's not even removal that's the problem. So if CT CX equals zero, then wait, what? Wait, actually, why are we doing plus plus count? Oh wait, yeah, okay, no. So if they're not already set by their component, then we add it to the answer. And okay, where's the first place where this is wrong? So we have we have two here, that's expected. Four here, that's expected. We get all of this. Five here, six here, seven. So this should be seven instead of eight. Wait, is that right? Once we take these, we should get all of these. And once we take this one, we should get 7. Um, so if the friend x equals 0. Okay, maybe it's this. Wait, what? That doesn't make sense. How do we avoid total 2 here? Um... So zero. Why is it zero? Oh, X is, doesn't X isn't even a thing. Okay. Let's test it on the sample again. Now that's very wrong. Great. Um, okay, what happens here? Is any of this right? Is removal wrong, maybe? So total two zero. Now we have zero. Pointers at 6, as we expect, which means we take this, so we get 3 intervals. Then once we're here, moving this doesn't matter, so we get to keep these. Once we're here, we get another few, right? No, because we have to, it's not here because we have to get this one somehow, and there's no way to get that one, other than taking this one, which would make it not part of an interval. Okay, 
So, so now we have to take this, and we have to take this, and there's nothing we can do. So now we can't even touch the ones, so we're done. Now that works. Um, now let's figure out what's wrong with this now. Because now this causes the rest of the samples to break. Wait, what? Oh, maybe we looked at the wrong numbers? What? Oh, wait. Um... No, it's wrong now. Okay, why? So we have to take these, then we get all of them. So we get three at the beginning. Then once we take these, um, because number two has a connection number one, that's fine. Now once we take this, the only thing that can touch three is this, so that should also be fine. Why is that not fine? Um, must be removal. What changes here? So even though this one is removed, like it's still part of the component. So why does this happen? We get um, so now I have to put stuff in remove. Why is it decrease? What decreases it? Because it should be here. Um, CLB. So we have one. Wait. Oh, that's the problem. When we remove two here, we need to do this first. Yeah, because otherwise we're screwing ourselves. So that'll fix the sample, but does it make it better? Um, Because what that means is we have to, yeah, because we want the remaining element after we remove this. But if we have possibly this element inside, then that's going to screw us. Okay, now the question is, can we do the rest of this fine? Yeah, I think so. So again, I, I hope the order doesn't matter here. So if this is in the same component, then... Like, if this is in the same component and it's a friend, then... Wait, 
Well, actually, we haven't removed this from the component yet, so that should be fine. One. Yeah, so we haven't removed this from the component yet. Always be consistent. Nine O. Oh. What are we printing? Okay, so we've already checked that we reset everything. Let's make sure this all makes sense. So if there are no friends, then now we get a friend. So we add one to the count in that component. So if there's nothing in that component, then we automatically gain something. If um, we're recording, that's good. If the count is one, then then there that may be already set. So if that's the one that isn't set from the component, then we increase it. Otherwise, it's already set, so we don't care. Then add one to the friends. Now we check the component. So if if, if there's one thing in the component and the one thing that's affected by it is friendless so far, then it gets, we get something out of it. Otherwise, if there's nothing in the component, then the things that aren't friended will all become friended except for possibly this one. So we say, first of all, we count the things that are friended. Then we count the things that will become toggled after. And either it includes this one if it's friended, or it doesn't if it's not. So first of all, it's the size of the component minus one, which is the new amount. Then if this one is on already, then we add one. Update the count, insert into the set, and update the possibilities. So now, do the same thing. So we delete the count. If the count is zero, subtract. Otherwise, if there's something in the component and that's the only thing it has, then subtract it. And if friend x is greater than 1, we don't care. So now um, we erase it. So if 1, then if the thing that had a friend before, or like if the thing that's the only thing in the component now is going to change, then we will change it. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. Then Otherwise, if it's zero, then the new value is the count. The current value is the amount we have, and if this one's set already, then increase it, then update the value. Now this is simple. Change the size. Edges, targ, two pointers. OK. We're going to submit. Wait, what was the thing? That um, constraints in some translations. Okay, I think we're fine. All right, while we wait, I'm going to go to the bathroom. See you guys in a sec.
Alright, we got it. Sweet. Okay, so that's that. Um, that was really messy, I think, but we got it. That is awesome. So where does that put us? Oh, everyone has three. And now we do two. We have no penalties on it so far. It's very nice. So, before we... Okay, I don't think this problem is even feasible to try. Like, who, who has attempted this right now? Yeah, like, everyone has TLE'd this. Um, also looks complicated, so we're gonna go for beautiful subsequence first, and before we do that, I'm just gonna go down and get some water. Be right back. Okay, we're back. Um, where are we right now? We're in seventh. Okay, we're back in seventh. Actually, it's funny. So now we have to solve beautiful subsequence, I guess, and it's gonna be fun. Wow, how how long did it take him to solve this? Did it in fifty fifty eight minutes? Which means like 30, 37 minutes. That's insane. Anyway, we will try and go for um, beautiful subsequence. Gonna refresh myself on what the problem is. So you have a sequence with an even length 2L. The sequence is good if it's possible to cyclically shift it to make it so the smallest value in one half is greater than the largest value in the other half. Number of its non empty contiguous subsequences, even length, which is good. All right, what can we do with this? So there's a small subset of problems, so there's a small subset of people who have one of these two problems. I think, um, it's going to be it's going to be very hard to solve both of these. I imagine because there are 14 people right now, or there are 16 people in total who have either of these. So, wow.
I guess this one was the harder one, or was it just ordered later, so maybe people have tried it less. Okay, wow, nobody has solved beautiful subsequence in Div 2 yet. How's Div 2 doing? I guess just um, based on speed on the first four. Alright. So let's let's go for this. One number of its non-empty contiguous subsequences with even length, which is good. Actually, what's the, um, the status page for this? Seems like it's harder to get this one wrong, although many people have. Yeah. So if you can see, it's um, 1.50 p.m. right now. So I might uh, eat lunch like at some point during this. I'll still keep going for the contest, so hopefully it won't be that disruptive, I guess. Anyway, let's do this. How do we do this? So even though we did two pointers on the other one, we can't do it on this one. So then how do we do it? Generally, with these types of counting problems, we have to fix something. Like, either we fix the start, we fix the end, both are equivalent. Um, we fix something about the value, or we fix the length. I don't know if there's anything else we can fix. If so, 
Uh, <laughs> that would be nice to know. Maybe that would be the answer. I'm still here, by the way. I just don't have any ideas right now. So the solve counts on these problems are not changing, which is interesting.
hear a bunch of like stomping sounds, that's because I'm pacing around. Does anyone sell four? No, someone does. But they do it faster than me, so my rank doesn't change at least. Speed matters. Okay. I'm sorry for the lack of commentary, though. I really don't have anything to say. I don't know where to go with this right now. Just start by doing something stupid like reading the input. Corner compression here. Um, sort by by plus n. Because um, because everything is distinct, corner compression is easier. Um, let's say a by a i equals i. All right, by a i dot second. That'll make it so, for example, 4213 becomes um, 012, zero, no, 010, zero, zero, no, sorry, 3102. Since the things are up to 10 to the 9th, that's useful. Let's just make sure it's done. Because we don't want to write this whole solution only to find out that coordinate compression is the problem. 0 0.23, 3, 3, perfect. And that's because we sort by value and we maintain the indices so that we know the position of each index in the sorted array. And then we set it to that position. That's how coordinate compression works. So now we've read the input, we've done the easy part. Now we have to do the hard part. Um, someone else solve four. Not even. Ooh, we, we solves like everything. Okay. So this is hard. This is very hard. But then again, the other one was supposed to be hard too. So, I don't know. Maybe there's some trick we're missing. Let's say we do fix the beginning, then. Is there anything good to come out of that? I'm not sure if there is. What if we have some like custom segmentry? Um, So the idea of fixing the the median is enticing because what it means is we can have some sort of custom segmentry and then changing the median by one means we like we set elements to zeros and ones where it's zero if it's less than or equal to the median and one if it's greater. Then um then we just need to count how many of the sequences of zeros and ones are good, which may be easier. I'm not sure. 
Then if we do it on a segment tree, what we can do is um, we do it on a segment tree. Why does that make it easier? Well, if we do it on a segment tree, then we could immediately set an element to one, and then we know that if that's the median, then all um, all subarrays that have it have to contain that element. So we kind of like it turns into a query problem with segment trees. Now then, how do we make that segment tree? Um, this feels like it feels like it could be the right direction, so I'm going to pursue it for a while. And if it doesn't work, we'll try something else. Um, okay, so we need to store some information about two ranges and then combine them. So since the segment tree is like reverse divide and conquer, any new um, any new good sequence is going to come from the middle, basically. Huh, that is interesting. This feels like it should work, actually. What are the submissions for this? Has anyone, okay, a lot of people have tried it, and even the number two right now has tried it and he hasn't gotten anywhere, so I don't think that's a good plan. Let's just close this and just stay focused on this. So this is kind of interesting. Because let's say we have some split point defined. Um, either we have either a good su subsequence looks like this zero 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 zero. Then like all right, let's make it nicer. So let's say we have three zeros and a one and a zero and three ones. Um. Okay, so we have 39 minutes. Let's just go for this. Two people to solve four. And they're both above me, which is fine. Okay, let's go for this. So we have 1110 or 0001. Um, okay, wait. So let's do... Um, This is kind of redundant doing both of these at the same time, but I don't really care. So 
so that's going to look like this. Or it'll look like this, for example. 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. Or the same thing, symmetrical. 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Or some number of 1s in the middle, then some number of zeros on the end. It can be like that, it can be like that, it doesn't matter. So basically in each segment tree node, we have to store information like this. Um, we have to store the number of ones in a group on the right and or the number of zeros and then the next group. Oh my god, this is going to be so annoying. Very unhappy with having to solve this, but we're going to try it anyway because I don't know, why not? Why not? Just why not? Maybe there's some more elegant solution? I don't know. I hope there would be, but I can't. This is like the only thing I've ever thought of in the uh, 30 minutes or so I've thought about this, so we're just going to go with it. And I'm going to have to focus because I have to implement all this right. LZ, LO, LT. So this is number of zeros, number of ones, and then which LT is zero if the zero is first and otherwise one. RZ, RO, RT. God. Okay. So we don't need lazy propagation, which is good at least. We need a non lazy segment tree, which means um, return tree i equals v. These constraints are going to be terrible too. 10 to the 6th with 2.5 seconds. I don't think that's nice. I don't think it is. Especially for the crap we have to do here. Okay. So we're going to get rid of this. We don't need it. L is greater than R. So now we also don't need lazy. Um. And the implementation for this is, in, in fact, incredibly simple once we finish the segment tree part. What it be is all v equals bi. So we do, for example, seg tree of annoying type. Then um, seg 
entry down at NC. t.update v and we'll set it to 1 oh, tote equals dot query 0 and minus 1 <sighs> if v is greater than 0 tote minus equals st.query 0 v minus 1 It's plus equals total. Then that's it. So now we just have to do query and update. And it's going to be so painful. Sorry about the indentation. Okay.
Okay. How do we even do this? So that's simple, at least. So first, if RT equals other dot RT. This is if we have some formation where we draw from the ones on the left. For example, this. So we take some amount of ones from here and some amount of zeros from here. Then we'll do the same for the right. Then we'll do the same for when this is exactly four. Um, so this is min other, no, this is R, not RT. Then, um, t dot count plus equals max B of 2 minus min B. Okay. Min B minus 1 over 2. So that's the lowest we can get, so we can get everything within that range of that length. For example, here, the minimum we will get will be 2, and the maximum we would get would also be 2 because there are zeros on this side. So that's fine. Then we'll do the same thing, except this will be RRT. We'll keep count, then min v equals this, and max v equals. Not a LT. Then if C mod two is equal to zero, O C equals R not R T plus other dot L. How does this work? So be the freedom we have. 
let's say we're for example we have six zeros here then we'll take this interval and then we can take any number of zeros we want on both sides so we could take these we could take these or we could take these We have five zeros, however, we have to limit it to this length, which is good to note. So min c that plus min c that. OC minus c plus one. Okay. So that's how we update the counts. Now we have to merge these things. So wait, first of all, if it doesn't exist, return other. If not other dot exist, return Guess it would be that. Return this. Now we do merging. So So if if one thing spans the full thing, then let's do left first. Yeah, we'll do left and then right since they're basically equivalent. So either There are three cases. Let's say we have the split here. Either we have, say, 0, 0, 1, 1, and then the ones before the split. We have 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. In this case, everything is before the split. Or this continues into the split. So the first case happens when we have um, that. So if the whole thing is equal to the size, nt dot Then okay, here we have two cases too. Either um, either this is zero or this is one. So if other dot l other dot no wait if other dot l t equals l t, then n t dot guess first of all n t dot l t l t. If other dot lt is equal to lt, then um, something happens. Okay, this isn't even right. This, this, there are more cases for this, which is not fun.
wait, and t dot l dot l t equals that LT is equal to not LT, then in that case, we also have two cases for this one. Either this is the same or it isn't. So if it's the same, then it's whatever this is plus whatever this is. And otherwise, it's just whatever this is. Now we do the exact same thing if other dot r rt is equal to size. It should be other dot size. So either these are the same or they aren't, and t dot r rt equals other dot size plus r rt and t dot r not rt equals uh, what would that be? That would be r rt. Size and t dot r not lt equals r not rt. Basically just copying the other one.
I love this. This is so fun to do. Okay, so what have we initialized? We've initialized exist. Um, and t dot exist equals one. True. Long long count. Then we do l r size. Okay, we don't need null v. <sighs> we're actually we're so close. Okay. Are we close? I don't know, because we could very much be wrong. And that would not be fun. So now we have to handle one more special case, and that's this. So we have 0, 0, 1, 1. Then we use this as the zeros. Then we have some ones over here. So, first of all, this is LO um, C equals L LT. No, this is R RT. Then Now we do c equals other dot l other dot lt. O c equals min c r r t other dot lt. Okay, I am dead inside. This problem has done that to me. One now, what? Absolutely no way this works. It's always room for <laughs> Jesus. Okay. I mean, okay, that's a bit more wrong than I expected, but like, come on, man. All right, how does it change as we go on? So we um I'm gonna do one. So four, one, two, three, four. Okay, so this is big number. This is this is very small number. This is even more small number. I don't know what's up with that. Okay. So now we know what we have to do. Do all this. Now I'm even more dead inside. So 
that we've finished this in time. Finish out the function. Okay. Um. So none of these numbers exist. Um, that's cool. So we do this instead. Okay, but as soon as we combine, it gets screwed. Why does it take away my input? Okay, as soon as we combine, it gets screwed. Why? Not exist, return other, other than, not other than exist, return this. What now? No, oh, don't even initialize it here. Eighteen. Okay. What the hell? I'm pretty sure we have very little time left. Wait, did they take away the submit box? Okay. Very confused here. Um, this is quite annoying. Now, why is that nine? Is this just a random value that doesn't exist? Why does it change so much? Because here we just set count equals zero. So in init we do that. <clears throat> so like this exists, right? Zero, zero, one. Right, so all these values are zero. Then I 
it's like something like that. How does the count become like that when it's not? Okay, so praying it changes the answer. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we're just totally screwed here. I might as well keep trying till the end. And then why not? Can't hurt. Yeah, we're down here. Where did I end up? 15th, okay. There's more people. Sold though for. I'm not actually sure what this will do to rating. Maybe it will knock me out. Okay, um, yeah, we're not going to get that anytime soon. Not really sure what to do about it. So let's do something else. I'm going to first solve the div2 problems and then um, go over them and all my solutions. And small boxes arranged in a line from one to n. Each round i the way the ith box. So now, we're going to count the number of round trips, trips we make. Um, so curve plus equals AI. If So if curve plus ai is greater than k, then we have to drop. So plus plus ants, cur equals ai, because we have to take the elements in order. And that should be it. Or not. plus AI is greater than K. What are we doing? Oh. Okay. 
submit that. As soon as I move it to practice, I guess. Um, yeah, they will have to move it to practice. Anyway. Store that one and then I guess we'll do this one too. Binary string S with length N and integer K. String is said to be K foldable. It can be changed to a string with length K by repeating the following process without any collisions. K is a divisor of N. It's important. Select the prefix of the current string N with length 2K. each I to check if it's a pound drum. Okay. So first we count the number of zeros and the number of ones. Now, um, if C0 mod K is not equal to 0, so both the counts of the characters must be divisible by K. Otherwise, um, Explain this once we once we um, finish. to be divisible by k, it has to be divisible by the number of groups. Since like you need, for example, there are three groups here and they all need to be palindromic, so you need um, the same number of characters in each group, so it has to be divisible by that. That's my bad. Why? What? Uh, wait. Yeah, okay. Okay, 
can we submit this one? Wrong one. What do we just do? Okay. Should it be that? Okay, is the size of the groups, I guess that makes sense. Okay, I'll bear back, go to that again. And all right, so after this we'll explain the solutions. Alright, so I will go over the problems I did solve, and then we'll see about the problems I didn't solve. Waiting for my rating to decrease, whenever that will happen. Okay, so we'll go over this. Then, um, plug on that, and I guess we'll try to do beautiful subsequence, but I'm not confident in my actual solution. It might not work. So... Let's go ahead and try it. Okay, chef and work. So you're given two integers, n and k. So let's say, um, let's say k equals seven, for example. Then you have, uh, like an array of integers, let's say uh, 2, 6, 3, 4, 1, 7, 5, 7. And basically what you want to do is, you're going to simulate a process. So you're going to start from the left, and you're going to take as many elements as you can such that the sum of them is less than or equal to k. So for example, you can't take this because the sum is 11. 
Um, you can't take this because the sum is 8, but you can take this because the sum is 2. And you want to take the longest possible, um, yeah, you want to take the longest possible one. And then you want to find out how many groups you're going to end up making. So here the sum is 2. If you took the 6, it would be 8, so it wouldn't work. Here the sum is 6. Here the sum is 7. Here the sum is 1. Here the sum is 7. Here the sum is 5. And here the sum is 7. So you end up with 7 groups in total. And basically, the way to simulate this is you'll just go through the array. Right? So initially you have to start, and the, and the sum of your current group is 0, and you've created one group. So now we go here. So now our sum is 2, and we still don't need to create another group. Now we're here. So if we took 6, then it would make our sum 8. We make our sum 8, which is not good and not possible. So we have to create a new group, reset our sum to 6, and now we have two groups. So now we're here. If we took 3, then we would have sum 9. Nice. And um, that wouldn't work. So we have to reset to 3, create another group. We go here. We can take this. So now our sum is 7, and we don't create another group. Now we're here, we can't take that, so our sum is 1, we do 4, we do basically the same thing, so we do 7, then 5, then 7, and we just count the number of groups we make and then print that at the end. And it's optimal to take as many things as possible because otherwise you would have to take it in some future group and that would reduce your ability to take even more numbers in the future. So if there's, for example, say we're here, if there's some number that we can take in our current group that we're making, do it. Because otherwise like it's gonna make, it may make it harder in the future. Like if this was a six, then we would have to create another group for these, but rather we can do this and then take that one. So it's always optimal to take as many elements elements as possible. Okay, that was chef and work. Let's do k fold little string. So a, let's let's do the definition first. A string is said to be k foldable. Let's say we have the output of the sample. A string is said to be k foldable with k equals two, for example, if every substring. Every contiguous substring of length 4 is a palindrome. Or rather, not every contiguous substring, but... Like, let's say we break the string into groups of k. Then every two groups form a palindrome. So this should be a palindrome, that should be a palindrome, and that should be a palindrome. <laughs> um, so we're given some string. Like, for example, let's take the input. So O... O O O one 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 O one. Um Yeah. So how do we do this? Um O O O one 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 O one. So we can rearrange these characters in any way we want. For example, we can Swap these two, we can swap these two, we can swap these two, we can even swap this and this after making that swap. And we'll do, we'll rearrange them however we want. Okay, now, what we have to do is make the string k foldable, and if so, we want the lexicographically smallest one. That means, like, if you converted this to a binary number, it will be as small as possible. So essentially, like comparing two strings to find which one's lexicographically earlier, you find the first place where they're different, and then the one that's the one where that position is less than the other one is lexicographically smaller. So for example, this string is smaller because they differ here, and this is a zero while this is a one. Meanwhile, um, this string will be smaller here because they differ here, and it's a zero and one. Anyway. I think you get it. So let's also like compute the number C and we'll represent C as like, I don't know, the number of groups. So we have four groups here. 
Now, for it to be a palindrome, since all of them are even length, all groups have to have the same number of characters. That is, all groups have to have the same number of ones, and all of them have to have the same number of zeros. It turns out that's the only condition that's necessary, because if we, like, if that condition's true, for the, um, for the lexicographically minimal string, we'll want to start with a bunch of zeros and then a bunch of ones. Let's say like this. And then once we do this, to create a new string, we can simply reverse the previous one we had. So let's see if I can use MS Paint successfully. Um, can I rotate? Nice. That looks terrible. But um, <laughs> that's basically the idea. So we go here, and then over here we put the reverse, and then over here, we put the reverse of the reverse, which is the original string. And this is always; these are always going to be palindromes because it's like, by definition, the reverse of the other one. So this is lexicographically minimal. And so basically the only condition is if the um, number of zeros and number of ones divisible by, are divisible by C, Then we can make a construction like this, where we initially put all zeros down, then all ones, then all ones down, then all zeros, then all zeros down, then all ones, etc. Then we, yeah, then we, then we can make that construction. Otherwise, it's not possible because again, every group must have the same number of characters. So that that is it. Um, the runtime error I got was using dividing by, like trying to put. Um, Checking if this was divisible by k instead of c, which doesn't work. So it would have also been a wrong answer. Check the rating again. Okay, hasn't dropped yet. So I know it's going to drop because I know how these numbers work. And if it doesn't, it'll be a pleasant surprise, I guess. Okay, in this problem, you're given a polygon. Let's say you have five sides. And what you're going to do is you're going to create a new polygon out of chords. And a chord and a polygon connects any two vertices. For example, it can't connect two edges because these aren't vertices. It can connect these two. And it also can't connect adjacent ones. So it has to be two vertices that are kind of separate from each other. And you're going to create a new polygon from only the chords of the original one. I'm sorry, this is terrible. So let's do something like that. So let's say, for example, you create a polygon like this, where it's a triangle on this hexagon. And basically, you want to maximize, you want to find the maximum possible number of sides of all the polygons you create, which includes the initial ones. So this would be a side, this would be a side, these greens would be a side, and you count all of this. So this would be nine. So, and you do this process until you can't create anymore. For example, when you have this pentagon, you can create one chord and then two chords, but then these are too close, so you can't create another one. And that's bad. So, first of all, you want more vertices because that gives you more room to create chords. So at every step, you want to create the biggest, or you want to create the polygon with the most number of vertices possible. And the way to, to the way to create this is to basically pick some starting vertex. Then you pair it with another vertex that's two away. Then you pair it with another vertex that's two away. Then you pair it with another vertex that's two away, up until you basically get back to the starting point. So if n is even, then you get a polygon of length uh, with n over two sides. Otherwise, let's create... Um, something where n isn't even, like a, what is it, heptagon? I don't remember. Five, six, seven. Now the way to do this would, you still want to create as many vertices as possible, so go two away, 
drying hands a bit off. Then another two away. Then if we were to go another two away, then we would trap ourselves, because we don't have a final chord to make here. So instead, on the last step, we need to make three away. So we basically get m minus 1 over 2. So it's either n over 2 if even, or m minus 1 over 2 if odd, which, is, which you can summarize nice, neatly in floor of n over 2. So essentially, if you start with 7 vertices, then you'll get the three vertices. And anything less than or equal to five vertices, you can show that you can't create another polygon out of it. So, that's the way it works. So basically, the strategy is the points don't actually matter because it's guaranteed to be convex. So you can literally like ignore almost the entire input. All you care about is n. So you start with n, first you add 25, then you set it to floor n over 2, then you add that, then you set it to floor n over 2, n over 2, and you add that, then you set it to floor n over 2, and you add that, and now we're under 5, or we're less than or equal to 5, so we're done. And then the total is the sum of all these, which is 46, I think, and that'll be how you do it. So that's the problem. Okay, now, this problem is more interesting, but still relatively standard. I'm going to check my rating every time, just to see what happens. Okay, so, we have a tree. Um, what do we do with this tree? Let's say we have a tree. Actually, I'm going to hijack the input. So we have a tree. One, two, one, three, two, four. Ah, oh, sir. In this, we have a binary tree. Okay. And we want to. The problem says red and blue. We're just going to use ones and zeros. So we want to basically assign ones and zeros to each of these vertices, such that there are no. There's no vertex with label 1 adjacent to another vertex of label 1, and same for the zeros. So for example, this would be violated here by, for example, these two vertices are adjacent and they both have zeros, and these two vertices are adjacent and they both have 1. So this tree has two violations. And so you're given the tree, initially each vertex has a label. So for example, let's say the purple ones were the input labels. Then, in one move, we can pick two adjacent vertices and swap their values. So this becomes 1, this becomes 0. And we want to find the minimum number of operations to make it so the property holds. That is, there are no two adjacent vertices with the same value. Now, no two adjacent vertices with the same value is interesting, because... It's basically the definition of a bipartite graph. That is, you have you have two different sides, and edges are only between the things of the two sides. So for example, if we put everything with label 0 on one side and everything with label 1 on another side, then it would be bipartite only if there are no edges between any two zeros and no edges between any two ones. So now we need to make the tree bipartite. And that's a more standard problem to think about. So let's say let's say we assign the root a color, right? So let's say we say this this has to be zero. Then everything adjacent to it has to be the opposite color. So this is this is one and one. Then everything adjacent to it those has to be the opposite color. And this is only dependent on what color we made the root. Because once we fix the color of the root, all the other colors are predetermined. And there are only two possibilities because there are two colors for the root. We can always do this because a graph is bipartite only when it has a cycle of odd length, for example, 3. But trees don't have cycles, so they're always bipartite. And so we can always make this kind of color. Now let's verify when is a color possible. So, first, actually, there's only one condition, that the counts of the zeros and the counts of the ones 
are the same. So for example, let's say we did this, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Then the count of the zeros and the counts of the ones must be the same. And this is because, like, there's a construction for this. Imagine where, imagine any time you have a 1 and a 0, where a 1's above a 0, you move the 1 down, right? So we'll end up with a tree, we'll end up with values that are like this. So 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0. Okay, wait, this isn't, that's not helpful. Um... Basically because we can swap the values of any two vertices, like, in kind of like a bubble sort fashion maybe, we can, let's say this leaf is incorrect, right? So we'll find some, for example, it's 1 and we want to make it 0. So we find some other 0, for example here. Then we swap it, so now this is correct. Maybe this is wrong. But, which it isn't, but this is correct. So now we say this node's done, and we remove it from the tree. Now we have a smaller tree where the counts are still the same. So now we can do the same strategy. We'll find some zero, bring it down, and now we can remove this. So now we have a tree with five, and we just keep doing this until we eventually uh, make the values what we want. So there's a construction that always lets us do whatever we want as, as long as the counts are the same. So now we need to find the minimum number of operations. So first of all, well, yeah, actually. So we can try both possible colorings, that is, when this one's 0 and when this one's 1. And we'll just take the minimum of both of them, or whichever one's possible. It may be it may be true that neither of them are possible. Exactly one is possible, or both. It doesn't matter. It's not really that hard to check, so it should be fine. And now, how do we check? Well, um, that's interesting. The way we check is essentially, um, oh, sorry, the way we count the, sorry, I'm a bit tired after this, but um, slightly disoriented, but the way we count the number of operations is each operation has to go through one edge. Like, each operation goes through, like, this operation will go through this edge and the vertices on the two sides of this edge. So instead of counting the total number of operations in total, we'll count it for each edge and then sum them up. That is, how many vertices, how many values are going to be switched through this edge? And it turns out, let's say, for example, we have this edge. Then we have a certain number of zeros that are wrong. And so let's call this W0 for number of wrong zeros that should be changed, and W1 for number of wrong ones. And we also have some number of wrong ones on this side. Wrong 0, wrong 1. As it turns out, these are the same, and these are the same. Because if not, then the total counts wouldn't be the same. Um. Actually, is that true? I'm not sure. I may not be true, actually, but that doesn't matter. The point is, actually, what, what does matter is the difference between these is equal to the difference, the opposite difference between these. Um, which means that we have Let's say we have a few extra zeros on this side, like we have this many more zero, wrong zeros than wrong ones, then that means we have more wrong ones on this side than wrong zeros. So let's say we have... Um, a certain number of wrong zeros on here. Alright, so here actually we have two wrong ones. 
In this red subtree, we have two wrong ones and one wrong zero. And basically, it's optimal to pair as many of the same things in a subtree as possible. So we would want to pair one of the wrong zeros with one of the wrong ones in the subtree. And then we have one of the wrong ones that has to go through the edge to the other subtree. Now, why is it true that we want to make this pairing? Well, let's think of it like this. So we have an edge. Let's say, for example, we have a wrong zero here. We have a wrong one here. And they're going like this. So we have this wrong zero paired up with this wrong one. And we have this wrong zero paired up with this wrong one, right? But like this is kind of redundant because these paths are going the same way to the same vertices, and so is this. So we're passing over this edge twice when we could just pass over it no times at all. So these paths are better because they don't unnecessarily go through that edge. So therefore, any pairing of a 0 and a 1, any two pairings of zeros and 1s, can be reduced to no pairings. Because it's better to pair them like this and like this instead of like this and like this because it overlaps on this edge. And we're like wasting time here. So it's always going to be like that. So then the answer for an edge is, let's say for the subtree below it, it's the maximum of the wrong zeros and the wrong ones minus the minimum of the wrong zeros and the wrong ones. So you can compute the wrong zeros and the wrong ones with like a tree DP. Essentially, if this is wrong, add it to some count, and then it's and then add the number of wrong ones and zeros from all of the children. Um, that's the way it works. And that's essentially it. So first check if it's possible if the counts are the same, and then sum up basically this quantity, the max minus the min, which we can show is optimal. Uh, this problem has showed shown up before, problems like this, although um, it basically is exact replicas, actually. But, I mean, whatever. <coughs> okay. We have two problems left. Have we lost red yet? No, we haven't. Sad. We have two problems left. Not really... Don't think I can go over this one in much detail. So we'll do chefing and dishes. Okay, I'm just gonna do the formal, like the formal mathematical one here, because I don't really want to explain how it works, mostly. So you have so you're gonna graph with two types of edges. The first edge the first edges are blue edges. Actually, let's say something else. You're going to graph where every vertex has a label. Okay. So let's say, for example, um, we're going to steal the sample again. So this is, this is label 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now there are two types. All right, yeah. Wait, what am I doing? Each vertex has a value on it. So now there are two types of edges. There are blue edges. Blue edges are created by connecting every two vertices that have the same value. So these two vertices have the same value, these two and these two. But these two don't, so you won't create a blue edge between them. So similarly, these also have blue edges between them. There are also green edges. Green edges are given somewhere else in the input. And the blue edges are... The blue edges are undirected, which means like they go both ways, although we can draw arrows if we want to make them directed, it doesn't actually matter. And the green edges are directed. Uh, okay, the arrows are going to make it very messy. But the green edges are directed. And there are at most, um, there are nk, n times k green edges, where k is either 1, 2, or 3. So there aren't that many green edges. Um, well, obviously, because you have to read it in as the input. But 
let's steal, steal the sample here. So you have, for example, a green edge from here to here, a green edge from here to here, a green edge from, okay, it just happens that all of these are undirected, but that's not necessary, so I'm not going to draw them that way. And a green edge from here to here. Okay, and actually all these vertices also have an index. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So you're going to select some vertices. When you select a vertex, basically you'll say um, all of its neighbors uh, get painted in purple or something. I don't know. Right, so this is a neighbor. So let's say we select vertex 5. Now, this is a neighbor of 4 by the blue edge, so it gets colored. This is a neighbor both by a green edge and a blue edge, so it gets colored, and the rest of these don't get colored. We can also select multiple vertices in which, like, all of the neighbors of, like, still all the neighbors of the vertices we select get colored. So if we write out, so we're going to pick two integers, L and R running out of colors here, L and R, for example, 2 to 5. Then we're going to select all of the vertices within this range. So we're going to select vertex 2, which means we're going to color this, and color this. Then we select vertex 3, so we color 2, color 4. Then we select vertex 4, so we color 5 and 6. And then we select vertex 5, and everything's already colored. So our goal is to find out the number of LR pairs such that everything is colored. That is the problem. How do we solve it? So the idea is, if you add another vertex, it only makes, it, it's only better. Because either more vertices will be colored or nothing will change. So that means, for example, let's say you force, so you're starting from 2, so L equals 2 and then you want to find all the valid choices for r. There's some value of r, so that... There's some value of r, such that everything before this doesn't work, and then all the intervals after this do work. Um, and the way we're going to do this is with two pointers. So basically, you have one pointer here, and one pointer here. Now... Basically, while this doesn't work, we move this pointer forward. Then, then we set this pointer to be, um, then this pointer will be like the, the earliest place where it does work, right? Now, once we change L from 2 to 3, like there's no reason to ever move the pointer backwards because we already know this doesn't work. And since we removed a vertex, it's only, like, harder to solve the problem from removing this vertex. So if it doesn't work before, it's never going to start working later. And therefore, this pointer only ever moves to the right. Which means this pointer moves n times, and the red pointer will also move n times. So in total, it's O of n times the... Um, the time complexity of checking if something's possible. Which is cool. That's nice to work with. So we need to, now we just need to quickly check if something's possible. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to maintain the colored, the number of colored vertices over time, and also a bunch of other information. Um, it is very messy, actually. So first what we need to do is we need to Let's just pick, like, let's say we have some, like, set of the vertices we've taken, like two, three, right? So we need some, we need a function to insert something into the set, and we also need a function to delete something from the set. Which means that everything, so when we insert something, everything that doesn't already have a neighbor, but is a neighbor of this, will be colored. And when we delete something, everything that was a neighbor of this and is a neighbor and is also a neighbor of nothing else will be like its color will be gone. 
and nothing else will change. So when we insert something, we only need to find out the ones where they don't have any neighbors, but now they're neighbors of four. And the same thing here, we need to find the ones where they were neighbors of two, but they have no other neighbors, so when we remove two, they'll lose their color. So um, insertion and deletion are actually almost the same. It's very similar. You just need to like do out some casework and stuff. So I'm only going to talk about insertion, and then you can work out deletion for yourself. But again, they're almost the same. Like in my own code, I basically copy pasted. Um, in my own code, I basically copy pasted insertion into deletion. Like they're very similar. You can't really see it here because it's not a good display, but they're very similar. Oh wow. It actually stayed red. Cool. All right, that's not bad. Would have been better if we had solved the fourth problem and then like done a bit better. But you know, that's fine. We stay red. We still got it. We only moved down one in the U.S., so we're fine. We'll just, we'll just keep on being barely red, I guess. That's how it's going to work. Okay, now how do we do insertion here? Um... The way we do this is we, sorry, my train of thought is writing away. So the way we do this is either it's going to be adjacent by a green edge or a blue edge. And in like a normal graph problem, all we have to do is we just look at all the edges outgoing from the vertex we just add. And then we set them to, and then we increment a counter if they're colored, if they're colored because we just added the new vertex. Like they had no other neighbors before, but now they do. The issue with this is that there can be a lot of edges. Like for example, take, um, so you have like seven vertices all with the same value, right? So they all have the value seven. Then you're going to have a blue edge between like everything. So you're going to have, um, n choose two blue edges, which is n m minus one over two, which is o of n squared blue edges. Which means in total, it's going to take o of n squared to do this two pointers thing. And of course, imagine if you have 300,000 vertices all with the same value, this program's never going to finish. As, I mean, it's going to time out. So, avoiding TLE, we need to do something smarter. Indeed, there is something smart to do. So let's look at, let's think about each component. Like each, sorry, each blue component. Right, so we'll assume all these have the same value. I'm not going to draw all the edges, but they're basically connected. Now let's say we like pop some vertex down. Right, so we put this into the set. Now automatically, everything connected with this blue edge is going to be colored in purple except for the vertex we just added. But if we add another edge in this component, if we add another vertex in this component, then everything in the entire component is going to be colored. That is very important. Which means, in terms of what we care about, each component only has three values of label vertices. Either it has none, it has exactly one, or it has greater than or equal to two. So let's think about the cases. If it has zero, then all these blue edges don't matter. If it has one, then then every every vertex in this component will be colored, except for possibly this one. If this one has a green edge that goes into it and it's labeled, then it might be colored, but otherwise it won't be colored. And then if there are at least two, everything in the component's colored. So now we don't have to explicitly go over the edges. What we're going to instead do is we're going to maintain a count of how many, like let's say we have some green edges going into this component. We're going to maintain a count of how many vertices are colored purple by the green edges, like because of green edges and not because of blue edges. So let's say, for example, we have three. Then 
we color this vertex or we insert this vertex into the set. Now we have we have three um, like we have three vertices that are already colored, which we keep track of. Then once we do this, we're gonna have either four or five vertices that are already colored, depending on if this one is already colored or not. All right. So the difference in terms of the total number of vertices we have is just like this minus this. And for deletion, it's the same thing, except it's it changes by this minus this. So that's it, basically. Um, that's how we deal with components. And if we, so that's how we go from 0 to 1. And to go from 1 to 2, like this, like the, the previous vertex, like the vertex that was previously the only one is either is either um, turned on by a blue edge or it's not. And whether it's turned on by a blue edge or not is like if it's already been colored by the green edge or not. So that we can check. So for each component, we maintain the number of vertices that have been colored by green edges already and not by blue edges. And so another convenience thing is we, instead of maintaining if something's been colored, we maintain the number of green edges that go into it. That way, when it, then we delete it, we'll easily know if it doesn't have any more green edges or not. Um, hang on. So I'm going to go over my code and see if there's anything else I forgot to talk about, since there may as well could be. Might as well could be. So this is insertion. And the way this works is, for each neighbor, if... For each, like, for each green edge that goes out from this vertex, for example, this one, it would be to 1. So for each green edge that goes out, if it doesn't have any other green edges that go into it already, then... So wait, if it... Let's say we have... Um, say we have a graph with three vertices, we don't really care about blue edges, and we're here. So we've already taken this vertex, and therefore this is colored. So if we have a green edge here, we need to make sure we don't double count the same vertex. Because remember, what we're doing, I'm not sure if I said this actually, but what we're going to do for our strategy is we're going to maintain the number of vertices that are purple. And then each time we need to check if it's equal to n or not. So we don't want to recount this vertex. So basically we need to check if this the vertex that we're about to add a green edge to either already has a green edge or it has a blue edge that's affecting it. So we check both. First of all, if it already has a green edge, we'll just ignore it, but we'll add to the number of friends. Otherwise, otherwise, um, even if it isn't already set, then we need to add it to the count of vertices in the component it's in that has a green edge going into it. So, for example, this would become 4 if we added that edge. But, however, if, if we already had this, and this was already 4, then we already had this, we wouldn't recount that, because that would, again, be double counting. So then, if there are no vertices in its component, then, like, this green edge, no matter what, is going to be the first thing that colors as vertex, so it's going to be colored, and therefore we can increment the total. Otherwise, if its component has at least two things, then it's already colored in the component, so we ignore it. And otherwise, otherwise there's exactly one vertex in its component. So either like something else is colored, in which case this is um, Like, this is already colored by this blue component, or it's not colored. Or, so either it's some other vertex, in which case this is automatically colored, or it's this vertex, in which case it's not automatically colored. So if it's this vertex, then we <coughs> increment the total. And I use a set to maintain the set of vertices that are in each thing, because that's convenient. Right, okay, so now we have to update the components. 
So because we add, like, we when we add a vertex into the set, we add a new thing to its component. So here we do this. So if there's exactly one other vertex, then if it's not already colored by a green edge, then now this one becomes, um, this one will color this one via a blue edge. So we have to increment the total. Otherwise, like it's already touched by a green edge, so we don't we ignore it. Otherwise, if there's none, then we do the same thing. We count the number of vertices that are already on by already colored by green edges. Then we count the number of vertices that will be on once we add this to the component. And if it includes the vertex that we're adding right now, that is, there's already a green edge into this one, then it becomes five. Otherwise, it's four. And we like increment that. Then we just add to the total. And then we increase the count of vertices in its component. For example, now this will be three. And we insert into the set. Then we maintain if it's possible by checking if the total is n. Deletion is basically the same thing, but you subtract, erase, and do everything backwards. And basically, this is the two pointer part. So let's like while the pointer is less than n and it's still not possible, just increase the pointer. And then everything after this, like for example, let's say we have this one, two, three, four, five, six, and these are our vertices, and the left pointer is here and the right pointer is here. Like everything after this is going to work. So it's just like the distance the pointer is from the end of the array. That's where um, n minus pointer plus one comes from. Then we delete it. And so we insert the place at the pointer, then we delete the current index, and we move on. Anyway, that is that. This is kind of an interesting graph now. Hopefully it'll go up again. We have the lunchtime coming up next. Okay, this one I'm going to go over very briefly, because like I'm pretty sure it works, but I mean, I just... I'm not ready to implement it right now after spending over three hours on this, and um, like it is absolutely disgusting, my idea, so maybe there's a better way to do it. Maybe there isn't. But what I did was, um, you should know what a segment tree is, first of all. If you know, so basically I created a custom segment tree, and that segment tree is going to maintain That segment tree is going to maintain a sequence of ones and zeros. And basically, we want to count the number of good subsequences that are made of ones or zeros. And the reason we can do this is because we can fix the median of the array. So for example, let's say we have one, two, four, three. Then we say the median is going to be three, which means this is going to be the element that's the cutoff point. Everything less than or equal to three is going to be on one side of the array, and everything greater than three is going to be on the other side of the array. So then, for example, all of these will be set to 0 because they're less than or equal to 3, and all these will, and the other ones will be set to 1. Or, actually, it doesn't matter the other way around. It doesn't really matter. Then when we change the median from, let's say, for example, let's say the median's currently 2, then we want to change the median to 3. All we have to do is update this value to be 1. And then... Of course, since this value is the median, and all values are distinct, every subarray has to contain this median. So to do this, let's say this is the median. We query the total number of good subarrays, then we query the number of good subarrays that are within this and within this range. Because then like, we take the total minus this and minus this. That way, everything else will have to go through this value. And that's exactly what we want. So the way to create the segment tree is as follows. You store a ton of information. It just it, it's just like look at this look at this print line, this debugging line. I really hope there's a better way to do this because I mean honestly, this is just painful. So you store a bunch of things. Um, first of all, you store on each node the number of good um, subarrays. Then you have to store, let's say this whole thing is a node. Then you have to store two things. Or you have to store a bunch of things. First, on the left, you store 
the leftmost character, for example, this would be zero. Then you store the length of the leftmost sub, sub, subarray of zeros. And then you store the length of the leftmost subarray of the thing that's not zero, the thing that's different from zero. So if I add a one here, then it would store that the first thing on the left is one. Then we have a sequence of length one of ones. Then we have a sequence of length two of zeros. And the rest of these we don't care about. I hope. I don't think so. Then we do the exact same thing for the right. The right thing is one. Then we have sequence of length one and sequence of length two. Um, okay. And that's that. And then we also just keep track of the size of nodes. And then to merge them, to merge them, I will, well, we have three cases for, so first of all, let's say we're merging these two. So these are different nodes. So first of all, we keep all of the good subarrays that are in these individual ones, then any new good subarrays have to like go across the middle, which is something I I just realized I overcounted. Um, so we actually can get rid of this part because it's not necessary, because we would have already counted it in some other thing. What am I thinking? Anyway. So now when we do more, it doesn't matter. It wouldn't have, um, I wouldn't have gotten it anyway. Cause like we were getting um, runtime errors, I think. And all the values were garbage values and just nothing was working. So that was not my only mistake, which is fine. Well, not fine. We shouldn't have mistakes, but that was not the only one. Um, so now we're going to do something else. So basically to merge, we have three cases for which, or we have some number of cases for which ones we create subarrays for. Either these are the same or they're different. If these are the same, then we have some number of zeros on both sides and we have some number of ones. Pretty sure this whole thing is over counting actually, uh, which is okay. So first of all, Um, anyway, there's some, I actually don't know how to do this, so maybe it is not possible, but there's some way to handle the cases where, there's some way to handle the cases where, like, either these are the same or they're different. And if they're different, then you have to take some number of zeros from this and some number of ones from this. And it's just the minimum, like you can take two, or you can take four, or if you have, or you can take four, or if you have six, you can take six, but you can't. So it's basically the minimum of the number of zeros and the number of ones, floor divided by two. Um, you can figure out why. Yeah, so basic idea is custom segment tree, very, 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 very annoying. And that's all I have. Um, I didn't even read the last problem because nobody solved it. Like, look at this. Nobody solved it. So that would be it. We got 15th. Um, not terrible. Still stay red. Happy about that. And I guess we'll finish off on that. Um, hope you enjoyed. This was very long. Quite painful video. But, yeah, that's it.